Hello, and thank you for joining us here at Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga, and each week we invite you to send in your questions and we'll explore the fascinating stories of the city of Mississauga together. For this week's episode, we're going to focus our, our attention on the story of the Indigenous Mississaugas and specifically the Credit Mission Village. We've received numerous questions over time around the stories of the Mississauga, and we will explore some of those today here on Ask a Historian. The Credit Mission, also known as the Credit Indian Village, was located on what is today part of the Mississauga Golf and Country Club on Mississauga Road. The Credit Mission was part of a government plan to settle and ultimately assimilate the Indigenous peoples in one area and to allow for settlement in the surrounding lands, that is, non-Indigenous settlement. The mission was built between 1826 under the uh, built in 1826 under the direction of Peter Jones, who was a, uh, who would become chief of the Mississaugas in 1829, Kekekekuanabai, and Colonel James Given, the superintendent of Indian Affairs. The village was located on the high grounds overlooking the Credit River and the Credit River Valley, and the valley lands were cultivated for farming purposes. An early description of the village describes an elevated plateau cleared of wood with three rows of detached cottages among fields surrounded by rail fences. In 1837, the village grew to include 52 family dwellings with an estimated 500 acres that were cleared for cultivation. Every family at the Credit Mission had a half acre around their own house for, for a personal garden, but they shared the cultivated lands in the valley. In addition to the village site, the Mississaugas also had use of land on one mile on each side of the Credit River. And again, from this land that was cultivated on behalf of the Crown, each, pro each family was responsible for a 50 acre portion of it, where they would farm and raise grain and livestock and the like. Other, uh, some of the produce included potatoes and other root vegetables and apples. They also had livestock for pork and beef. And by the 1830s, the Mississaugas had cultivated over 900 acres of land of the 3,000 acre Credit Indian Reserve. In 1838, Eliza Jones, the wife of Reverend Peter Jones, wrote, The little village is situated on the high and healthy banks of a fine river, whose beautiful flowing waters well, were well supplied with fish. This village consists of about 40 houses. Some of these are called log and others frame each surrounded by a half acre of land in which the Indians plant every year either potatoes, peas, or corn. In the center stands on one side the chapel and a schoolhouse, and on the other a mission house, near which is reserved a lovely spot on the brow of the hill for sacred to the cemetery and the memory of the dead. Despite many government misgivings, the Mississaugas proved that the plan of creating a village was a success under the direction of Reverend Peter Jones and his brother uh, John Jones, as well as their uncle, Chief Joseph Sawyer, and others, including Egerton Ryerson. Uh, the Mississaugas prospered, at least in terms of the, the government perspective of their, of, their, uh, of their village, and early travelers' account illustrate the respect and favorable acknowledgement that was expressed to what the Mississaugas were accomplishing at the Credit Mission. It is gratifying to perceive, perceive that instead of drunken and savage brawls, happiness and peace have sprung among them, good order, sobriety, and cleanliness in house and person. Their demeanor is moral, their attendance at divine worship regular, and the observance of church, church service grave and attentive. The Credit Mission, again under the direction of Reverend Peter Jones and others, thrived for more than a decade. Pressure from surrounding settlement, the loss of title to their traditional lands, and a decline in population led the Mississaugas to relocate to the new Credit Reserve in 1847. The village itself, here in what is today the city of Mississauga, eventually got vanished. The meeting lodge, a barn, and a building that was called the Chief's Residence stood until the 1920s. Since 1906, the property has been home to the Mississauga Golf and Country Club. Even a portion of Mississauga Road, which once ran through the village, was realigned, obscuring the original site. So that, in a sense, is the story of the site of the Credit Mission, but it, of course, doesn't tell the entire story. The government plan, again, was to build a village in order to um, change the way of life into more of a European model, and assimilation is not an easy word. Uh, it does literally mean, you know, cultural uh, extermination or cu uh, cultural elimination. Um, the Mississaugas, under 
their direction of the the uh, superintendent of Indian Affairs and and their leaders at the time uh, thought that adopting Christianity and Christian teaching or English teaching methods and, uh, and agricultural practices was essential to continuing to exist as, as as a people and a culture and so you had this drastic cultural transition that was happening at the credit mission um, we of course look at it today a little bit more critically than perhaps at the time when it was more a battle of, of uh, a means of survival, if you will, uh, as, as a people. So the Credit Mission story is uh, a, a, a most interesting part of our, our city's story, but also integral to understanding the evolution of the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Um, and uh, that the, they in, did indeed live in a government-built village at a time within their ancestral homeland or within their homeland of uh, the Credit River Valley. Um, but uh, in time, uh, that, that village, although it prospered in European eyes, uh, it, did, it did eventually decline, leading to relocation in 1847. So uh, a celebrated part of our story and our, our city's identity and our city's history is the story of the Credit Mission uh, and where it was located on the Mississauga Gulf and Country Club, today marked by Chitwa Tigans, the Sacred Garden, which commemorates the existence of the village and the story of the Mississaugas. But the, the Credit Mission Village, again, uh, a relatively short-lived uh, experiment, if you will. Uh, it uh, was on the on the site between 1826 and 1847, and then ultimately uh, disappearing in time. Uh, but uh, it is uh, it's not without its challenges to reinterpret kind of the um, uh, the, the life and the change that was uh, what was being undertaken the adoption of Christianity uh, the ending of traditional lifestyles uh, more uh, European or, or Canadian ways of raising crops and uh, and living in, in domiciles uh, in, in, in structured houses um, all part of a, a drastic cultural shift in a very short period of time that the uh, the Mississaugas of the Credit River faced and again ultimately leading to their relocation to the new credit reserve in 1847. Integral to the understanding and, uh, and the discussion around the credit mission is the story of the Jones brothers. Uh, the, the Jones brothers, uh, the elder brother John Jones, uh, who lived between 1798 and 1847, and his younger, jo younger brother, uh, the famed Reverend Peter Jones, who lived between 1802 and 1856. They were the sons of surveyor Augustus Jones and uh, Tabenaque... Sorry, I'm going to say that again. Tabenaque daughter of Mississauga Chief Wabanase. And I apologize, I'm, I, uh, Anishinaabe is not a language that I am well versed in and, and names are sometimes difficult. Uh, but uh, they were the grandsons of a Mississauga Chief and the sons of a Welsh surveyor. So they, they literally walked uh, the brothers John and uh, John and Peter walked with a foot in two different worlds, um, uh, being raised and educated part of their life with uh, their father and part of their life with their mother's people, and so really embracing a dual culture, if you will. Um, Reverend Peter Jones was elected chief of the Mississaugas in 1829, although he had uh, previously in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, been a, a Christian minister, uh, uh, missionary through the Methodist Church. Um, and uh, he really focused on the Mississaugas of the Credit River becoming a, what, a quote, a new race of people. Uh, equal to the settlers around them. He, uh, Reverend Peter Jones, with the assistance of his, his brother John uh, and his uncle, Chief Joseph Sawyer, uh, sought to establish a firm economic base for the community and to protect the fisheries from encroachment of, of European settlers and to firmly root Christianity into and education at the Credit Mission. To this end, the village itself, the Credit Mission village, became home to a Methodist chapel and a schoolhouse. Um, the Credit River uh, Mississauga's conversion to Christianity involved more than just an adoption of English names, uh, and change came very rapidly within a generation. The Mississaugas moved from traditional bark structures scattered over a large area to, to uh, uh, purpose-built log homes uh, and some frame homes uh, set close by together, and this meant uh, abandoning communal living, uh, adopting more European or Canadian styles of, of housing and of family structures. 
Um, and, uh, you know, with, with the building of the village, two families came to share each log cabin um, and very much more as a Euro structured uh, type of society was, was, uh, was, was being introduced to the Mississaugas in very short order. Under the teachings of John Jones, the Mississaugas learned new farming techniques. Uh, once, a, uh, once accustomed to harvesting from nature and the traditional uses of indigenous plants, the Mississaugas uh, adopted uh, uh, cultivation. Uh, their farms grew wheat, oats, peas, corn, potatoes, and other vegetables, and they also learned to maintain small orchards. Uh, however, the introduction of farming did not uh, cause the Mississaugas to abandon all of their traditional uh, crops and, and uh, indigenous plants. Uh, a common traditional crop planting was known as the Three Sisters, which involved companion planting of squash, corn, and beans together. The many indigenous plants uh, uh, found in the community uh, were, were used for both food and medicine by the Mississaugas, and there was still a, a deep belief in uh, you know traditional medicines and traditional healing. Uh, traditional harvested food crops included maple syrup, wild rice, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, wood lilies, giant hyssop, uh, ferns, goosefoot, uh, marsh elder, barley, sumac berries, cranberries, grapes, and of course a wide array of nuts and the like. Wild plants used for medicinal purposes included uh, uh, gallardia, wild rose, harebell, wild flax, uh, blue, st uh, blue stem grass, wild uh, bergamot, uh, wild mint, and sage, amongst many others. Sacred to their ceremonies were sweet grass and tobacco, um, and uh, these continued to be uh, um, culturally embraced by the Mississaugas, even as they adopted uh, new forms of, of uh, cultivating the land and, uh, and uh, adopting Christianity. The Mississaugas also harvested from nature the buildings, the materials needed for building, uh, including canoes, baskets, and other items for daily life. Um, the Mississaugas left very little physical trace of their time on this land, and there's very little physical evidence that survives from the Credit Mission Village itself, although early maps do provide a good deal of information around its location. Um, but the story of, of uh, the Credit Mission is tied intrinsically to the story of the brothers uh, Peter and John Jones, as uh, Peter is as, uh, as, as a, a very prominent early leader, both in the Methodist or Christian worlds and in the in the indigenous Mississaugas world, he traveled abroad greatly. Well, it was his brother John, for the most part, who uh, managed the uh, or led the day to day life at the Credit Mission, alongside others. Of course, they they were not alone in this, uh, but uh, they are intrinsic to the story of the Credit Mission. And down in Port Credit, you will find uh, uh, in the Port Credit Heritage Conservation District, you'll find John and Peter Streets, which are named for the brothers John and Peter Jones. Again, intrinsic to the story of the Mississaugas and of the development of the Credit Mission Village. When it comes to the story of residential schools, we often get asked a question around whether or not uh, there was a residential school at the Credit Mission. And the answer in short was no, there never was, but it was not for uh, lack of desire. Um, go back in time to the first year of the Credit Mission in 1826 under the direction of, of Reverend Peter Jones. And Egerton Ryerson uh, found himself posted as a young Christian minister, uh, Methodist minister. Uh, he posted to the Credit Mission here in what is today the city of Mississauga. Ryerson, again 23 years old, uh, uh, arrived in the fall of 1826 and he spent a year at the, at the Credit Mission. Um, he had met Reverend Peter Jones, Kekake Kekwanabai, uh, previously, and they developed a strong friendship. Uh, Jones, who was only a year older than Egerton Ryerson, uh, and uh, the two maintained a friendship for the rest of their lives. Uh, the Mississaugas of the Credit River came to respect Ryerson, um, as he made an effort to work alongside them and to learn the Anishinaabe language, but make no mistake, uh, both Reverend Peter Jones and Egerton Ryerson were, were Christians on, on, uh, with an ex express purpose of converting the Mississaugas to, to Methodism and Christianity, uh, as well as introducing uh, Christian-based education. Uh, in 1844, 17 years after uh, Ryerson was at the Credit Mission, he was appointed Chief Superintendent of Education for Upper Canada. 
A few short years later, in 1847, the Assistant Superintendent General of Indian Affairs asked Ryerson to produce a report on the Beth methods for establishing and operating residential schools for Indigenous children. The concept was not a new one for, for residential schools. Uh, similar schools existed elsewhere in the Mohawk Institute in Brampton. Uh, sorry, in, in, Brant, in Brantford. Uh, the Mohawk Institute Residential School in Brantford had been in operation since 1831. The Bagot Commission of 1844 had recommended uh, manual labor schools where Indigenous children would be separated from their parents. So the idea wasn't new, but uh, Egerton Ryerson in 1847 did support the idea of separate models of education for Indigenous children. Uh, the credit mission here in Mississauga was never home to a residential school, but again, not for lack of desire. Uh, under the direction of Reverend Peter Jones, and uh, the, a school was established at the Credit Mission. Um, it did not operate in the model of the residential schools that we would later come to to analyze and condemn. But uh, the, the, the students in the Credit Mission were not removed from their community and their families. In simple terms, the school at the Credit Mission, uh, as we understand it from uh, Professor Donald Smith's extensive work, Align overall more aligned with the cultural, linguistic, and religious shift that was happening within the credit mission community. Children at the school at the credit mission were taught in both uh, Anishinaabe and in English, uh, and it was difficult to re really separate the religious component from the educational aims of Jones and Ryerson, as both were fervent uh, uh, Methodist ministers, uh, uh, Christians, and missionaries. Certainly in Reverend Jones' hopes, the plans for the Mississaugas uh, and for both religion and education were well entwined. Uh, Reverend Jones, um, with regard to securing the future of the Credit, Credit River Mississaugas in Upper Canada, believed that the Mississaugas must achieve equality in the terms of civil and political rights, and I quote, as soon as they are capable of understanding and exercising such rights. The establishment of a school at the Credit Mission was integral to his vision of, 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 of learning and being able to exercise those rights. And the understanding of civil rights, land rights, and financial responsibility were also part of the intended education through that at the Credit Mission. Peter urged the government to the, uh, and Chief uh, Superintendent of Indian Affairs that the importance of establishing schools, both of learning and of industry, without delay would assist the education of the rising generation. In early 1844, towards the end of the credit mission here in historic Mississauga, Reverend uh, Jones advocated for the establishment of a ma manual labor residential school at the credit mission. For a myriad of reasons, the focus of the school shifted away from the credit mission to Muncie Town. Uh, in 1846, despite the fundraising efforts by Peter Jones, the plan to build a school at Muncie's town had still not reached a consensus. The Muncie Institute, also known as the Mount Elgin Industrial School or the Mount Elgin Indian Residential School, did open in 1847. However, by that time, Reverend Peter Jones and other Indigenous leaders had found fault in their implementation and their operation and, managed, uh, and had begun to withdraw their support from the residential school concept. Reverend Jones himself advocated for the establishment of residential schools, not as a means for erasing their separate identity, but rather as a tactic in the battle for, to survive. For Jones, it would seem that his own desires to establish a former residential school did not align with what eventually came to be and what we have come to condemn. As for the Mississaugas themselves, the young people from the New Credit Reserve were compelled to attend residential schools, including Mount Elgin, which operated between 1847 and 1946, and the Mohawk Institute Residential School, or the Mush Hole, as it was known in Brantford, which operated between 1831 and 1970, and likely others. We often get asked about where you can go to learn more information about uh, Indigenous history, particularly connecting to the city of Mississauga. And th there are a number of resources out there. On, on the bigger picture scale, in terms of the national story, uh, we, you can, of course, uh, review the 94 Calls to Action from the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. And there are a myriad of resources around understanding residential schools and the legacy, and the dark legacy see that they have left behind over generations in communities. But uh, you, you also can start with looking at uh, information around the Indian Act, uh, that piece of legislation that has shaped the lives of 
hundreds of thousands of people over generations. Uh, and there is a wonderful book that helps steer you through that process. I highly recommend it's called 21 Things You May uh, you may Not Know About the Indian Act. Uh, again, a, 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 an excellent resource and uh, highly recommend. Uh, in terms of local history, however, there are uh, a number of things to uh, connect to. Um, the uh, Probably the most famous is by uh, Donald Smith. is called Sacred Feathers, the story of Peter Jones and the Credit Mission Village. Uh, also by Donald Smith, in kind of a triumvirate of works, uh, uh, Mississauga Portraits, uh, Ojibwa Voices um, uh, from 19th century Canada. So uh, Mississauga Portraits, also an, an excellent read uh, for material and resources pertaining to the Mississaugas of the Credit River and the Anishinaabe people in, uh, in Ontario. Um, and the latest book by Donald Smith, uh, Seen But Not Seen, uh, again, uh, evocative look uh, at uh, Indigenous history in Canada um, and uh, kind of relations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Influential Canadians and the First Nations from 1840s and today, Seen But Not Seen by Donald Smith. And lastly, recommend, uh, highly recommend from a local history perspective from Heritage Mississauga is Mississauga the First 10,000 Years. Um, and uh, an excellent read to give an introduction to uh, our local history, but also our indigenous history here in, in the city of Mississauga, not only with the Mississaugas of the Credit River, but also the cultures that preceded them, the early woodland people and the Iroquoian people that, uh, that once uh, traversed this area. So again, Mississauga the First 10,000 Years, highly recommended in terms of a local history resource. So there's lots out there. There's lots to explore and lots to learn. Um, one of the things I've done in my many years in this job is uh, you never cease to learn. You never cease to have uh, evolving uh, uh, explorations of local history, but also your own or my own uh, uh, understandings of that story. And the evolution is continuous and the, and the, uh, the, the information is there, there's always more to learn, always more to find out, always more to try and understand. Um, so happy exploration and uh, it's uh, uh, important at any time, but perhaps even more important in this time as we come, uh, as, as we come to try to understand and grasp the, the, uh, the legacies of the residential schools um, and uh, their impact over a long period of time on the Indigenous people of Canada. Thank you. Thank you for spending some time with us here at Ask a Historian. And each week, please send in your questions and we'll explore the stories and the history around the city of Mississauga together. Thank you.